Yeah. Oh, is that or this? Hello, if you're just coming in and joining us, we still got another minute or so, so just wait for everybody to get on here before we get started. We're just doing a quick sound check here, so if you're watching now, you can be a part of it. Yeah. Looks like a few of you have gotten on to join us, and of course we have a few here in the church tonight, so glad you are with us today, and uh, we just want to let everybody know that this Sunday we're going to be uh, just having our 9 o'clock service. There will not be a 1015 service this Sunday due to a uh, very disproportional attendance. We've had... Uh, a good number of our people, it's not too crowded, but a good number of our people at the first service, and then we have just a, just a handful at the second service, so we thought that it would be good just to, just to have the, uh, the 9 o'clock service, and of course we do have masks available, uh, and those might even be a, a better idea to wear now uh, that we are uh, just in one service, uh, but we don't anticipate... Uh, much difference in crowd size due to the very small second service. So uh, we've added a few more chairs in the sanctuary to allow for social distancing. We've taken out the communion table uh, so we can squeeze a few more chairs in there. Uh, but we anticipate that uh, the one service won't be too crowded. And we do have masks available uh, for, for you to wear if you'd like. So uh, we're looking forward to it. This Sunday, 9 a.m., and we'll also be live streaming at 9 a.m. And there will be no 10.15 a.m. service. Well, I hope that uh, everybody who was planning to join us tonight is able to get on and watching us now. So let me open up with a word of prayer. Father, we pray that you would be with us tonight, God. We continue to pray for our nation and our world, God, as so many just crazy things are going on right now, God. Um, whether it's injustice, whether it's riots, whether it's the virus, um, all these things, God, sometimes we wonder what is happening and what can I do. Father, we pray that you would lead and guide us this week. Help us to reflect you, God, in our conversations, in the way that we interact with people. And God, may your Holy Spirit lead us and guide us as we go about living the Christian life this week. We pray tonight, God, as we open up your word, as we talk about the articles of faith, that you will illuminate them for us in a new way if we've heard them before. And uh, God, if, we, if there's some new content uh, that we hear tonight, God, we pray that it would really help us understand who you are and understand why we believe what we believe. And we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.
So glad you're here with us tonight. How's everybody doing? And if you're at home, you can just uh, answer to your computer screen or your TV screen or however you're watching. We're glad that you're with us, though. And uh, we haven't had too big of a crowd here yet on Wednesdays. There's just been a sprinkle of people each time, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we are we are open on Wednesdays, but we will still be doing a live stream. Because uh, I know there's many of you who uh, do not want to come out yet, and that is totally understandable. So we will be doing live stream for the indefinite future, both on Wednesdays and Sundays. And hopefully, once there's a vaccine and, and we get this whole thing behind us, uh, perhaps we can get everybody back to the sanctuary again. But uh, we want everybody to stay safe and healthy and give people options to be able to join at home. So uh, I know some of you uh, watching tonight are seeking membership in the Church of the Nazarene, and so we're glad that you're here if that is the case. This uh, three-part series I'm doing would be the first step to that. We're going to be going through the Articles of Faith. But if you're already a member of the Church, or if you've been coming here a long time, uh, still I think there's valuable information for us, so I'd invite you to still join us and, uh, and, and stay online with us because a lot of good stuff in here as we talk about the Articles of Faith and ask the question, what do we believe and why do we believe it? And um, so, uh, if you, uh, even if you just Google uh, Nazarene Articles of Faith, you can. there's a PDF copy of those you can print out. Uh, we can also print out physical copies of those for you if you are seeking membership. Um, I don't have any copies to give out tonight, but I will be uh, reading through the first few articles. There's 16, I believe, total, and we'll cover those throughout the next three Wednesdays. Um, but uh, if you'd like a copy, let me know and we can get you a copy. So, Articles 1 through 3 is where we'll, we will begin tonight. And as we do this series, we will sprinkle in a little bit of Church of the Nazarene history, uh, you know, here and there. And um, we might even devote one of, the, uh, one of the sessions just to the history of the Church of the Nazarene. Um, but, you know, um, that can be brief, and you can dig as deep as you want into that, so... Uh, for the, the, the main thing we're going to be going through is the Articles of Faith these next three weeks. So glad that you're here with us. The first three Articles of Faith, as we dive in, talk about God. And that's a good place to start, isn't it? Talking about God. And so Articles 1, 2, and 3 describe what we call the Trinity. Have you heard that word before, Trinity? The Triune God. Triune God. And um, before we start talking about God, it's always a good idea just to get the disclaimer that we don't fully understand God, right? I mean, 
we're literally his creation. And so for us to define God in these very specific ways is kind of an oxymoron, right? Because we are his creation and he is God. And there's so much we don't even know about the universe, let alone God. How could we possibly define him by putting him in a box? So with that being said, though, there are different things that we find in Scripture that help us understand God. There's different uh, attributes, different characters, um, and theologians and biblical scholars have been discussing this stuff, debating this stuff, documenting this stuff for centuries. But it is good to have that disclaimer. You know, we are God's creation, and there's so much about God that we don't know. It's, it, we, we just can't possibly put him in a box and say, okay, this is God, bam, 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 bam. And so with that being said, Articles 1 through 3 of the uh, Nazarene Articles of Faith uh, seek to describe God and what we believe about him. And so Article number 1 focuses on uh, God the Father. And so... We believe in the Trinity, the triune Godhead. God is both three distinct persons, but also one God. A little bit more about that in a minute. But uh, first, let's read Article 1, and here's what it says. It says that we believe in one eternally existent, infinite God. Sovereign creator, sustainer of the universe. He is the only God, holy in nature, the God who is holy love is triune in essential being, revealed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now this concept of the Trinity is insane. And maybe you've heard it before, maybe someone has tried to describe it to you before, maybe it has confused you in the past, you wouldn't be alone. It's nearly impossible to find a good analogy that really describes the Trinity. And I think right off the bat here, we just we, we start to understand that we can't define God. We can't put God in a box. God is beyond our understanding. And so we should, uh, when, when we seek to understand God, we, we should kind of have that perspective. I'm going to try to understand God, but I'm limited. I'm God's creation. There's only so much I can do. So the Trinity, one God, manifests as three distinct persons, but they are all God. And there's only one God. Is that crazy or what? That's what we believe. Uh, the word Trinity is actually never found in the Bible. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, the, 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 the concept of Trinity is something that we've come up with as Christians over the years uh, by reading Scripture and, uh, and coming to the conclusion that there's one God manifest as three distinct persons. And we will, uh, and actually I'm glad I have this water bottle here, because one analogy that might help us and forgive me, this is not going to be a perfect analogy. One analogy that might help us is looking at is looking at God as water. Looking at God as H2O. Now, water is, is you know, it's very distinct. We know what water is. We have a name for it. It is water. Um, but really, it's H2O. At a molecular level, you know, if, you, if you're taking a high school chemistry class, we know that uh, there's some different molecules and atoms that make up the substance called water, and it is H2O. Now, what happens when, we, uh, when water reaches a temperature, a very cold temperature, what happens? We know that when water reaches a cold temperature, it turns to ice. Now, ice is, you know, I mean, it's different than water. It looks different. It acts different. It feels different. Uh, we even call it a different name. We don't call ice water. We don't say, look, that's some frozen water. What do we say? We say, that's ice. But it's still H2O, right? The molecules, the, the, the chemistry composition of it is still the same. And of course, when we take that water and we boil it and we get it really hot, what happens? It creates steam. And... Um, Steam is still H2O. It's still the same substance. It's still the same thing. Inherently, intrinsically, it's still the, the same thing. But we call it something different. It looks different. It acts different. It functions differently. But it's all H2O. It's all the exact same thing. So maybe this can help us understand God. Um, and it's not a perfect analogy. 
But God is manifest as the Father. God is manifest as the Son. God is manifest as the Holy Spirit. But it's all God. And it's interesting because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit um, in, in some ways have different attributes or different, um, different qualities, um, so to speak. In other words, we know from Scripture that God the Father is the judge. We know that He, will, um, he acts as the, the, the judge of us, of His creation. We know that God the Son is the Savior. And we know that God the Holy Spirit is our advocate, and, and He is the, the person of the Trinity that lives within us, that convicts us, that leads us in sanctification, that guides us. And it's all God, and there's different names, but they're all the same thing. They're all God, the same, the same intrinsic being. It's not a perfect analogy, but uh, it's a hard concept. And like I said at the beginning, God is so big it blows our mind. We can't fully understand Him, and the Trinity, three distinct persons, one God, is a very good example of that. We, so so uh, moving on here a little bit, uh, we know that God is eternal. God is without limitation. God is also infinite. God existed before time. In fact, God created time. If you think about that long enough, it will kind of blow your mind. God created space, you know, physical space, and he created time. So he is, he is outside of space and time. Now, we have always lived in space and time. You know, there's, there's, there's space, there, there's creation, physical objects, the sky, you know. Um, there's time. Uh, but God's outside of all that. And so that's why this is so crazy. When, when, when we really try and think about God and understand God, we can't even come close because we are trapped in space and time. We are trapped in, in, in creation. And God is above that and beyond that. And so, uh, this is what we know about God. He's eternal, he's infinite. God is the definition of holy. To be holy is to be like God. Um, to be good is to be like God. To love is to be like God. Since God is the definition of what is right and wrong, because he is God. If we say, I want to be a good person, that means you would obey God. Because he's God, you know, he's a creator. Okay, so hopefully I haven't confused you too much yet. Um, but it's hard to describe God because God is um, so not able to be put in a box, easy to describe. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about uh, God the Father, we've talked a little bit about the Trinity. Uh, the second article of faith talks about Jesus. So these first three. Uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, we are at Article 2, talking about Jesus the Son. Here's what it says. It says, We believe in Jesus Christ, the second person of the triune Godhead, that He was eternally one with the Father, that He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, so that the two whole and perfect natures, God and man, are thus united in one person, who is both fully God and fully man, the God-man. So, you know, I mean, this stuff is uh, it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around sometimes, but Jesus was both fully God and fully human. I mean, it seems like an oxymoron, but uh, that, that is what the church fathers and the theologians, and, and that's what we gain from Scripture. God is both um, Jesus is both fully God and fully human. Um, that's a hard one. But uh, we know that uh, when Jesus came to earth, uh, he existed before that, right? He, he, he is eternal, ju just like God the Father, just like God. He's eternal, but he came to earth in, in this human manifestation. And he, he experienced temptation like we do. He experienced temptation. He experienced pain. He was fully human. But he was also God. I mean, he did miracles, and um, he was also God. But he still, he prayed to God the Father. You know, he, he experienced the Holy Spirit. But he was still God. 
It's crazy, you know, but this is what we believe. And some of this is just, it's so hard to wrap our minds around. We believe that Jesus was both fully God and fully human. We believe that the person of Jesus functioned as the fulfillment of um, all the prophecy in the Old Testament about the coming Messiah. Um, he was born uh, of, the vir of the Virgin Mary. Um, he, uh, and he's both fully God and fully human. Um, okay. I think uh, covers Jesus very, very briefly, of course. Uh, let's move on to the Holy Spirit. Article number three talks about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune Godhead, that he is ever-present and active within the Church of Christ, convincing the world of sin, regenerating those who repent and believe, sanctifying believers, and guiding into all truth as it is in Jesus. So the Holy Spirit is, um, is the manifestation, if you will, the manifestation of God which lives within us. We know through Scripture that uh, the Holy Spirit is the, the person who convicts us, who sanctifies us, who leads and guides us. Um, some people describe some of the work of the Holy Spirit like your conscience, in some ways. Um, that still small voice, sometimes. Um, the conviction you feel when you're doing something wrong. When you, when you sense God is speaking to you. That is the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit doing that. So again, we have the Father, who's the judge, the Son, who's the Savior, the Holy Spirit, who lives within us. Um, the Holy Spirit is involved in the regenerating process. We'll talk more about that, um, I think, next Wednesday. But um, this idea that God you know, changes us, transforms us from the inside out, that's the Holy Spirit. He's involved in sanctification, leading us in this journey of holiness throughout life and uh, guiding us in all truth. And so uh, the Holy Spirit is, uh, you know, when you read, sometimes you'll read the Bible and you think, wow, that's speaking to me. And that's the Holy Spirit doing the work within you. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Triune Godhead, we'll run out of time if we talk about it anymore. But uh, hopefully that kind of makes a little bit of sense if you're new to the church or new to the Church of the Nazarene. Um, our, uh, our understanding of God is not any different than any other mainline Christian denomination. It's, uh, it's very similar. So the, the Trinity, the Triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, perhaps you're more confused than when you first started watching, and um, that's because we can't put God in a box. He's so big, it's so hard for us to really understand Him sometimes. But that is uh, the God of Scripture, what we know through Scripture about God. Speaking of Scripture, article number four talks about the Bible and what we believe about the Bible. And here is what it says. We believe in the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures by which we understand the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments given by divine inspiration, inerrantly revealing the will of God concerning us in all things necessary for salvation. So that whatever is not contained in there is not to be an article of faith. Okay, there's a lot in there, and we'll break it down a little bit. Um, but one of the supporting scriptures uh, that we'll use tonight is Luke 24, verses 44 in 40, 44 through 47. This is Jesus um, you know, talk, talking about Scripture. Here's what he says. Jesus said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. Jesus told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins 
will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. This scripture here supports the fact that the, the purpose of the Bible is to lead us into salvation. And we hear it from Jesus himself. The purpose, the, the purpose of the law, the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, which encompass the Old Testament, this is uh, pointing to the Messiah which is Jesus. And so what Jesus is saying here is that the purpose of the Bible is to lead people into salvation. There, there's history in the Bible, but the Bible is not a history book. You know, um, There's poetry in the Bible, but the Bible is not a book of poetry. The purpose, the function of Scripture is to lead us to salvation. And uh, sometimes we uh, like to look at the Bible like a history book. And there's history in there, of course, but what we have to understand is the Bible was written from a very limited perspective. Um, it's, not a, uh, it, it's not like a te- written like a textbook that gives a, uh, you know unbiased examination of a historical event. It's written with a very limited perspective. And um, so sometimes when we compare the, an account in Scripture with an account in a, a history book, um, there's things that are a little bit different. The reason being, the Bible is not, uh, not primarily a history book. There's history in there, but it's written from a very specific perspective. Sometimes you'll read the Bible, and you'll come across a crazy story in the Old Testament. You ever been there? It'll be something like, uh, maybe it was... Uh, Somewhere in Genesis. There's a lot of crazy stories in Genesis, you know, where people do some pretty immoral things, where the followers of God do some pretty immoral things. You ever read a story like that? You know, you, you look at, you know, some of, the, some of the really highly esteemed folks in the Old Testament practice polygamy. That's just one example. And so when we read the Bible, we have to understand that the purpose of all of the Scripture is to point us towards Jesus, to point us towards Jesus, to point us towards Jesus. When we look at Genesis through Revelation, speaking of Revelation, you know, sometimes we'll open up Revelation or someone else will preach to us Revelation in a very specific way. The book of Revelation is meant to point us towards Jesus. Uh, So as we read Genesis through Revelation, we have to understand the big picture of the Bible. It's God's story of redemption. It's God's story of redeeming humanity who went astray from him. That is the story of Scripture, and that is the purpose of Scripture. There's lots of debate. Um, There are uh, biblical historians who have found, like, little textual errors in Scripture, or or sometimes, you know, because the Bible was originally written on manuscripts that were hand-copied, and they'll find one manuscript that's a little bit different than another manuscript, and they say, well, which one is right? And so through, you know, through, um, through study and through different methods, they can try and figure out uh, which one might be the most accurate, but sometimes there's a little textual errors and things that don't match up, but it's still scripture, it's still inspired, it's still God-breathed. But if we really like look at the Bible through the lens that the Bible is to point us towards salvation, point us towards Jesus, those things, those little textual variants or things like that don't matter as much when we understand the purpose of Scripture. We're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses, it'll be 15 through 17. From infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. He told them, excuse me, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's the purpose of scripture. It comes from God, and uh, one of the primary functions is that it would lead us into holiness, lead us into sanctification, point us towards Jesus. Allow us to be people of God who are thoroughly equipped 
for every good work. We, of course, believe that the Bible encompasses, you know, the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments, uh, the standard biblical canon, if you will. Um, yeah, I think we've covered everything there. All right, let's move on before we run out of time here. Um, okay, we're going to move to Article 5, which talks about sin. And I, I think we'll get through it. Um, there, there's a lot in there, and I'm, so I might not read it uh, word for word. Uh, and it, it can be a little confusing if you uh, have never read it before. So if, if you're reading an article of faith and it seems really confusing, you're not alone. You know, these were written by theologians, and sometimes they're very hard to understand. And sometimes they use big words that we have no idea what they are. But we'll try to explain everything. We'll try to talk about and explain everything. And so, um, article number five talks about sin. And so, uh, it, it breaks sin into two different categories. This is kind of interesting. It breaks sin into two different categories. The first category, call, it calls original sin or depravity. Original sin slash depravity. Second category is this idea of personal sin or actual sin is another word for it. Um, and so what, what is the difference between those two? Well, original sin, uh, and we're going to read, uh, we'll read Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, will help us understand original sin. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. And so, of course, uh, you know, Moses received the Ten Commandments, and so this is pre-Ten Commandments. The Bible says here that sin still existed. Because of the sin of Adam, people... You and I, everybody, has been born into sin, and that is original sin. We are born with a nature that is not perfect. In fact, we are born with a nature that has the um, propensity, if you will. Uh, we're born with a nature that um, has the propensity towards sin. Uh, in other words, uh, we, are, we are people who tend to sin, at least without Jesus. We're people who tend to sin. Maybe you can agree with that. Um, you know, we're not perfect. Some people are worse than others. We're not perfect. Uh, but that's original sin. It's this idea that um, we're born not perfect. And uh, it's not a matter of if. It's just a matter of when we're going to sin. So that's depravity. That's original sin. It's the idea of sin as, as part of our nature. As part of our nature, we're bound to do it. Original sin, depravity. Okay. Then we have... Um, Personal sin. And, and, and basically what happens is original sin will always lead to personal sin. What is personal sin? Personal sin is a voluntary violation of a known law of God by a morally responsible person. Very wordy. A voluntary violation of God's law by a person who's morally responsible. You know what you're doing. And so original sin, the depravity, that corruptness that we have inside of all of us that we're born with leads us to personal sin, which is us actually going out and sinning against God. So maybe because of original sin, we're tempted, we know we're not perfect, uh, but then when we go out and do it, we commit the crime, we do the sin, we disobey God, that is the actual sin. So there's a difference there. And the difference is this, um, primarily, the difference is this. Everybody is born sinful. Everybody. Um, however, we believe that those who are not morally responsible do not commit personal or actual sin. Uh, and maybe not everyone agrees with that, but that's the position of the church in Nazarene. In other words, infants, while we would believe theologically, we would believe that they were born, you know, sinful, um, and, until they get old enough to really understand the concept of sin, they don't then commit that 
that actual sin. And it's the same way with, with, uh, with folks who um, uh, you know, develop slowly mentally or have uh, various uh, mental conditions, if you will, um, that would not allow them to understand, to fully understand, um, this concept of sin. This concept of responsibility. I, I can't, you know, answer all the details there, but uh, only God knows. But basically what we believe is that um, those who cannot understand sin, those who, the, the infants who are not yet old enough to understand, the brains aren't developed enough yet, that they're still covered by God's grace. That's what it means in practical terms. They're still covered by God's grace. And so that, I think that's one of the main reasons we distinguish between original sin and, um, and personal sin or actual sin. So original sin is like this propensity, this urge for us to go out and sin. Um, it's that depravity in our nature. And then the actual sin is the actual sin. The personal sin is the actual sin. It's us breaking God's law. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, okay, let's read some more scripture. John chapter 8 says this, verse 34. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so we're going to talk about this concept a little bit more in a later, uh, a later lesson. But basically... What we believe is that we can be free from original sin. We can be free from that original depravity. Doesn't mean we're perfect. Some people uh, mistakenly believe that Nazarenes think that we can be perfect. We do believe that we can be free of that original sin. It doesn't mean that we're not going to commit the, the personal sins or the actual sins. We're, we're still going to sin. If you say you're without sin, the truth is not in you. It says that in the Bible. We're still, we still can sin, but what we believe is that God frees us from that original sin, that original depravity, that original selfishness, that uh, original mindset that we're born with that says, you know, I don't want to obey God. I want to go do my own thing. We believe that God frees us from that. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we believe God frees us from that. Now, we can still sin, but we don't really want to sin anymore. And maybe you've experienced that in your life. Maybe you look back on your past and, and, and it, you were just totally different. You know, you didn't really care about God's law, about doing right or wrong. Um, you just did what you wanted to do. But maybe now that you're a Christian, journeying through sanctification, God's working in you, um, you, you still sin. You still mess up, but you don't want to sin. You, know, you don't wake up in the morning and have this desire to sin. God's freed you from and so that's another reason that it breaks apart original sin from the personal sin. We believe that God can, fr can free us from that original sinful nature. And when he does that, through Jesus, through the sanctifying work of Jesus on the cross, you know, he cleanses us. We're new people. We're a new creation. But we can still sin. We're not perfect. Let's see if we want to... Okay, 1 John chapter 3, verse 9 tells us this. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. When we're filled with God's Spirit, we can't keep living the way we used to. God frees us from that. He gives us new desires. And, and we'll talk about that next week with regeneration. It's really, it's really awesome. Where God actually changes our desires. He actually changes our will. We'll get to that next week. Okay, we'll read, we'll read one more scripture here, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up here for today. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 11, kind of talks about this. You, it uses the word flesh to kind of describe this depravity. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So you kind of see the difference, you know, pre-Christian, post-Christian, how he frees us from that original sin. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. 
Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, you're a new creation. And, any, and, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. So we're still in the sinful body, we're not perfect, the Spirit gives us life, freeing us from that original depravity. Verse 11, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. We experience a life when we find Jesus, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we're filled with a, a life that frees us from that original depravity or that former mindset we used to have where we just didn't care about what God wants. We're free from that. We want to follow God. We, we, God changes our desires and we want to follow Him. Now, it doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we're totally free from sin because we know what the Scripture says. Those who claim to be without sin, the truth is not in them. So we can still sin. We're not perfect. But we're free from that mindset that says, I don't care. I don't care. I want to sin. I want to go do this. I don't care what God says. We're free from that. Because God changes our will and our desires. We'll talk about that more next week. Well, that is all for tonight. We're going to start next week uh, by talking about atonement. And then we're going to talk about um, justification, regeneration, adoption, and sanctification. So kind of that whole process that God does within us as, as we become Christians. And uh, it, it, it's a good one for sure, and I'm excited for it. Well, uh, thank you again for joining us for this uh, first lesson. I'm hoping we can keep it to three lessons. I think we can. Um, but if you are seeking church membership, please just make sure that I do know whether you contact me or the church office uh, so that uh, we can, because uh, once we're done with this, uh, there, there, there is uh, a couple more uh, steps. This is the main, the main thing, um, is this uh, three-part series. But there are a couple more steps that we want to talk to you about. So please just make sure that I'm aware so we can get you set up with, uh, with that, and we'll have a, a meeting. Um, a, a meeting with myself if you are interested in that we can talk about the uh, the next step after this so anyways um, thank you for joining us and uh, we're going to close a little bit of worship here tonight
Jesus. That's our prayer tonight, Father, that, that every day we would be renewed in you and that your spirit would fall fresh on us and that we would keep our hearts moldable so that you could work in us to, to complete the work you have for us here in this world. So God, I just pray that you continue to keep our hearts soft and keep your spirit flowing on us and through us, Jesus. God, thank you for your love and your word tonight. And we just pray that as we go about our week, that you would just remind us of the infilling of your spirit every day and that, uh, that we have strength in that. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.